Welcome to Evidence Based, a new Harbinger psychology podcast. I'm your host, Cassie Stossel. On today's episode, we're talking about decolonizing the body. We're joined by Kelsey Blackwell, author of Decolonizing the Body. Kelsey is a cultural somatics practitioner and writer dedicated to supporting women of color to trust and follow the guidance of the body so they may powerfully radiate their worth, dignity, and wisdom in a world which sorely needs this brilliance. As a facilitator, coach, and guest speaker, she has brought abolitionist and body practices to such diverse groups as writers on Bay Area Rapid Transit trains to students at Stanford University. She works one-on-one with clients as well as leads the eight-week group program Decolonizing the Body. Kelsey is author of the viral article, Why People of Color Need Spaces Without White People, published by the Arrow Journal. Hey, Kelsey, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm happy to be here. I thought we'd start off our conversation by just defining what is the colonized body? Yeah, so I think it's important to normalize that all of our bodies are colonized. When I'm speaking about a colonized body, what I'm talking about is the ways that our embodiment or how we are in our bodies has adapted to survive inside of systems of oppression. So those systems of oppression being white supremacy, uh, the patriarchy, uh, heteronormativity, racialized capitalism. And each of us has taken on certain attitudes or ways of navigating our life in order to survive inside of those systems. And my work, it really centers around how those adaptations are not just things that we might think about or uh, ways in which we're making decisions, but actually how we are in our bodies, how we are in taking up space, how we are moving through space. Yeah. And how how do all these years of conditioning impact the colonized body and what are some ways it shows up? So when we're looking at the impacts of colonization, we're, we're looking at our own history of like, how was I shaped based on the community that I was raised in, based on the family that I grew up in, based on the institutions that I interacted with. And we're also looking at what is the larger historical context of patterns that my lineage, people in my lineage may have taken on to survive, for example, uh, chattel slavery, to survive uh, genocide. And that's why I find working with the body so fascinating is because oftentimes uh, we kind of know what our environment was growing up. And there's a lot of different ways we can look at that. Like how was I impacted from you know, going to higher education? Uh, How was I impacted from growing up in a community where I didn't feel like I belonged? How was I impacted perhaps by having, you know, violence in my household or, or et cetera, right? So we can look at those layers, but then when we come to the body, we also start to experience ways in which this shaping can go back even before uh, before we were born, ways in which it's been passed down epigenetically. And I find that incredibly interesting and profound because when we start to feel or see that, then it gives us a different way of A, relating to ourselves and B, starting to heal some of these impacts. So to give you some more concrete examples, you know, I am identify as a, a cis a queer Black woman and I don't know my full lineage, but uh, I believe that my ancestors were slaves at some point. And what I find in uh, other women who might have had a similar background is that there are ways in which we have learned that in order to be safe, in order to protect ourselves, means that there are aspects of ourselves that we simply just can't bring forward. And this can impact how we're taking up space in a room, how we're making requests for ourselves, how what we even allow ourselves to receive support around. And uh, over time, the ways in which we've learned to protect ourselves in these systems, while at the same time, they, they do a- allow us some benefits of being able to survive in, in equitable environments. At the other, on the other side of the coin, they come at a cost. And that cost is often... Uh, getting to experience our full 
our full beingness, our full capacity for expression, our um, ability to rest, our ability to receive, our ability to simply just be. And it's those costs that uh, that often start to bring people into um, somatic work or other modalities to explore, well, what is going on here? And is there something that I can do that would allow me to feel more ease in my life? I totally agree. I think the body is so interesting in that way. And it, it seems like so much of of the responses may be unconscious, just passed down unconsciously for you. So I feel like you have to get to some level of self-awareness to realize where those things are coming from that show up in your body. Can you talk about your work and how you got into this work and, and how your program, your book, Decolonizing the Body came to be? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you make such a good point. You, it, it does take a level of awareness and that awareness is something that we come to often through trial and error or um, through age, right? Having, having noticed these patterns over and over again and realizing, okay, wait, there might be something here for me to just assess or uh, feel into or learn about. So my own background is that I grew up in a predominantly predominantly white Mormon community, uh, and my family is not Mormon and, and not white. So I always felt this sense of being on the outside of something. But because I'm in this body looking out, I didn't necessarily experience myself as a Black girl or Black woman navigating you know, navigating my world, it was only reflected to me in those moments of like, oh, you know, how come no one's asking me to the dance? Oh, how come I didn't get asked to the party? Oh, how come they, you know, how come they're questioning my ability to lead this team or or lead this project? And I would feel that that sense of being outside and I internalized it as like, oh, there must be something wrong with me. Um, I must be deficient in some way, though I would well, this wasn't a conscious internalization. This was just how I learned to relate with others so that I could find my place or a sense of belonging. So if I related from a sense of like being inferior, which was like, oh, no, you go ahead and you lead the team or, oh, no, your idea is the best idea or, oh, it's OK. No one asked me. It's, a, you know, like, I'm glad that you got asked. Right. And there was this sort of acceptance of, oh, okay, you know, I, I'm less than. And it wasn't until I ended up leaving Utah and, you know, studying in other cities around the, the country that I started to see, ah, this is, this is because I was the, the black girl and <laughs> with all, all these white Mormon conservative bodies. Uh, they didn't know what to do with me. And I didn't have the wherewithal or the maturity to stand up for myself. So that that's how I navigated that was to just kind of put myself at this, accept this sense of deficiency. And the one thing that really helped me survive that was that I loved to dance. And dancing was the one place where I really felt like I could finally be myself <laughs> and finally you know, be as free and alive as, um, as I, as I wanted to be. And, you know, there's this sort of funny story of me going to these school dances and just dancing my heart out and believing like in my head, like, oh, if they can, they're watching me and that now I'm going to be, now I'm going to be one of the popular kids, see what I can do, you know? And nobody was dancing the way I was dancing. So I, I, I again, was kind of an oddity. <laughs> like, huh, you know, what is she doing up there on the bleachers? Fascinating. I'm like, oh, look at me, I'm shining. Anyway, so my body was the place where I could feel the most at home. And I went to college and grad school and studied journalism. I didn't see dance as a, a career for myself. And I put my dancing kind of on the back burner. In fact, I stopped dancing for a long time. I ended up through a, a, a series of events coming back to that, that dance practice years after I had left it behind. And it was like coming home. It was like, oh yes, this is who I am. This is what I care about. And that practice led me to 
uh, another school of, um, uh, of dance that I'd never tried, which was more improvisational. And this school was called Interplay, which was a movement practice based on uh, what they call our birthright practices of movement, storytelling, and song. And being in that space also was like, oh my gosh, um, this is what I've been longing for. This makes so much sense to me. I feel so at home here. And uh, I started to realize that the ways in which I had been learned to adapt because of my upbringing had uh, truncated aspects of who I really was and how I wanted to be in the world. And, and uh, this sort of lack of confidence and internalized doubt and sense of deficiency, I could start to see how they showed up in these movement practices. And it gave me a different insight of, oh, this is something I can actually shift in my embodiment. And if I learn to inhabit myself in a different way, that actually changes how I am showing up when I'm not on the dance floor. And I think I'll say that dance sort of is a, uh, I use that term kind of loosely uh, because this practice is really more based on movement, movement and learning how to move the body and moving it from a place of joy, moving it from a place of curiosity, moving it from a place of like creativity. And being in that practice also showed me how, oh, when I'm, feeling my body and, and uh, relating or, or creating in this way, I'm also accessing things that my body is holding that I wasn't aware of. Uh, so those things that my body are, is holding is some of the trauma uh, that I experienced in my own upbringing and um, also some of the trauma that is carried in my, in my lineage. And I wanted to understand how to work with that as well and how that that trauma showed up i mean it really is it it's it varies by body but in my body it was this overwhelming sense of anxiety that i couldn't place to any particular thing and there would be even certain ways in which i i had to hold myself like say I was just sitting at a meeting or something, I would have to like, cut. I'd have my hands over my chest and my legs kind of up. And it, and I didn't realize, but I was like protecting my heart and my belly, these vital, these vital areas, because I didn't feel safe. And so this anxiety was showing up and saying, this isn't a safe environment. This isn't safe. Right. And that alert is something that uh, was triggered because of my current environment, but that went back into time of ways in which my ancestors, I believe, were in environments where it didn't feel safe for them. And so I wanted to learn how to work with these overwhelming emotional responses in my body. And that brought me to another type of practice of learning how we can actually come into our embodiment and as we do so, uh, metabolize some of the old stories or old wounds that we're holding. And oftentimes the way in which we come into that work or the way we start to feel for what we're holding are those emotions that we tend to avoid. So it's like the anxiety or it could be the depression or it could be the anger, right? The things that they show up and then we just stuff them down, stuff them away, or we disconnect from feeling altogether. And we just live our lives from our heads up. And that I could go on and say more about that, but <laughs> that's all, um, th that's the way in uh, I found in this work is starting to face those parts that feel so, so scary and, and uncomfortable. I like that your approach, first of all, thank you for sharing your story of how you got into this work. I love the, first of all, that your young self was telling you something through that movement and that your body was just wanting to move and dance. And, you know, I love that, you know, your young self was trying to tell you that. And I also think it's really cool how 
your work came in layers. Like, you know, you discovered this one thing and then you went out for information on this next thing and you continued to sort of unfold. And I think that's really powerful and, you know, shows your, your lifetime of work in this area. Ah, uh, thanks, Cassie. Yeah, you know, and I think that's really astute of you to notice because that is how the body often works. <laughs> <laughs> is in layers, is in layers. We feel something and then that leads us to something else and then that leads us to something else. And so getting into those places of feeling for our intergenerational trauma isn't often where people begin. They start with something else and then they follow that thread and then that thread leads them to, oh, okay, oh, I'm having this memory or, oh, this is showing up and I, I can't place where or why, but uh, there's something here that feels familiar, right? And that and that's how this work unfolds, exactly. Yeah, it's really cool. I want to talk a little bit about your book. In your book, you use the term radio dial. Can you talk about what that is and how people can begin to tune into theirs? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I like the analogy of thinking about the body as a radio dial because we've all had that experience. Well, I, I don't know if we all have, but uh, folks of a certain age have had that experience of trying to tune in their radio and uh, it can feel a little staticky. And then you like just t twist it a little bit more and then it like comes through and you're like, okay, I'm there, but then you're driving and you lose it again. And I think that being in relationship with our bodies can sometimes feel feel like that. Like when we tune in to what's happening on the level of the body, what we're often listening for is sensation. So sensation is the language of our body. And very quickly, we often turn sensation into emotion. So it's like, okay, you know, we, we might feel our heart beating. We might feel like a clamping around our, our throat. And before we even notice those sensations, we've named them as anxiety. Or we might feel like our face getting hot and our hands getting clammy. And before we've even named that, or before we've even named those sensations, we will call that anger, right? And if there's nothing happening that's particularly loud in the body, then oftentimes we're just sort of like, I'm fine. <laughs> Nothing's going on. <laughs> Everything's good. <laughs> and uh, what I believe and what I've experienced is that actually our bodies are like these sensitive antenna that are always connected to our environment. And they're picking up what's happening around us. They're also picking up what's happening in other bodies. And they're also kind of connected to uh, the ancestral body or what's happened before. And sometimes what it's picking up is really loud. And that's when we experience those really strong emotions. But sometimes what it's picking up is more subtle. And we can actually uh, attune our awareness to, to tune into those subtleties. And our ability to tune into those subtleties, those subtleties gives us more information not only about what's happening for ourselves, but also what's happening in our environment. And with that more information, then we have more at our disposal as we make our decisions about how we're gonna navigate our present situation. What I'm hoping that folks get in this book and what I, I wrote it with the intention of is that it's an introduction to starting to relate to one's body as this profound source of information. And that this information that our body is constantly communicating is actually in service to our thriving, is actually in service to our well being. And when the body is communicating something very loudly, that there's something there for us to take note of and take care of. And if we're in a really pleasant, beautiful environment, then there's something there to surrender to and allow in and to allow, uh, uh, allow to imprint us, right? And so being in relationship with our embodiment actually gives us more access to living our life with more connection and fullness. I really love the metaphor. And I think it makes it really easy to understand what you're feeling and how to, how to tune into that. 
And then I want to ask about, you use the term, the, the voice of the colonized self. Can you talk about what that is and why, why it shows up? Yeah. Yeah. The voice of the colonized self is that part of ourselves that often is signaling some kind of alert and it's some kind of alert that is intended to keep us small to keep us from taking a risk, to keep us from being seen. The, the voice of the colonized self, the reason that that voice shows up, which it could sound like, you know, just to give an example of what that could sound like, it could be like, oh yeah, that doesn't really matter. You don't need to, you don't need to say anything. Oh, no one's gonna understand that or, oh, you're overreacting, or it could even be um, like, why does it matter? You know, like something that you're wanting to go for, something that you're wanting to take a risk around, maybe um, extending yourself, like maybe it's applying for, for something, or maybe it's putting your work out into the world, or maybe it's, you know, uh, striking up that conversation with someone you find really interesting. And then that voice shows up and it's like, oh, well, what do you have to say? Is it really that unique? Is it really that? And it, it can sometimes sound like the inner critic, right? I think that's another way that that can show up. And the thing about that voice is that the reason it's so powerful is because what it's saying isn't totally false, <laughs> right? Like the truth is we do live inside of capitalism and all those systems I named earlier and that being seen or extending is, uh, it, it, it is risky, right? And at the same time, when we don't challenge the authority of that colonized voice, then we continue to uh, abide in the systems that we're sort of oppressed by in an unchallenged way. So we continue in, through our uh, listening to this voice and staying smaller than you know, the, the being that we really are, we in some ways perpetuate the very systems that we, you know, some part of us wants to, to break out of. I like to normalize that we all have that voice and that it thinks that it's keeping you safe. It thinks that it's protecting your need to belong. It, it thinks that it's protecting your need not to be seen so that you can have dignity. And at the same time, there, there's that other part of yourself that is opening up to extend into some future possibility. And the reason that that voice shows up is because it's afraid of that, of you listening to that part of yourself. And so decolonizing the body doesn't necessarily mean that we're no longer going to experience that voice, but that when we do see that that voice is showing up, we question it. And we ask, is this really true? And is there something else that's sparking in me or that's wanting to come forward that this voice is afraid of? And what is that part of myself? What does that part of myself have to say about what, what's possible here? And that discernment becomes really central in how we are navigating our life and making choices. Because so often what we do is we hear that voice of the inner colonizer and, and we just kind of trust it. We just kind of believe it. It, it. it leads us in an unquestioned, unchallenged way. And one of the things that can really help us start to be in that place of discernment is to notice what is happening in our body. It's like, oh, okay, that, that part of myself that's saying, I better get it right. I better be perfect. Oh, no one's going to understand me. Oh, I can feel where that lives in my body. That, that lives in my, my heart and my throat and my chest. And that part, oh, okay, I'm, I'm really familiar with those sensations. I see why that part of me is scared. And then it's like, oh, but there's this other part that's saying, huh, like, 
I have an idea. What could happen? And we hold it, then we notice, where's that in my body? Oh, that, okay, when I feel into that, I feel more of my legs. I feel more of my back body. And then we get to be with our full complexity. Ah, there's this part of me that's true, this heart beating and this like kind of frog in my throat. And then there's also this part of me that's true, that like my legs are are standing strong on the ground and I can feel my back body and I can feel my, my breath moving in and out. And then we get to say, hmm, which part of myself do I want to put in the driver's seat right now? <laughs> <laughs> not to deny and not to push away the part that's that's afraid, but to let it know that, hey, you don't actually have to make these decisions. You can be here. You're part of my embodiment. I'm not going to deny that. But you actually aren't the one who's going to be telling me what to do. So that was a, a bit of a complicated answer, but hopefully I kind of teased it out. Yeah, no, I don't think it was complicated at all. I was, I'm glad you mentioned the inner critic because I was going to ask if it was, it was similar to that. And I just appreciate that it, it is part of the brain. It is going to come up, but to question it, I think is just really powerful and probably totally a wild idea for a lot of people to even think that they could challenge it. Yes, yes. And the thing about that, that part of ourselves is that often it has some history and it's hard, I think it can be hard in the mind to, to kind of tease back, like, where did this, where did this come from? But when we feel it in the body, we, we get there much quicker. It's like, oh, okay, this frog in my throat and this chest beating. I remember in third grade when I was supposed to go on stage, but I didn't have my music right? Like something comes up, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when we sit with it and then we're like, oh, I see what this is, right? And inevitably, when we start to look at wh what what the information that's uh, shaping that, that part of ourselves, that inner colonized voice, we inevitably start to see the impacts of systemic oppression. Earning your continuing education hours doesn't have to be a painful experience. The right course can open your mind to new possibilities, increase your confidence, and hand you powerful tools to transform your clients' lives. Praxis Continuing Education and Training teams up with some of the brightest minds in mental health to provide cutting-edge, evidence-based training for practitioners. You can learn firsthand from experts like Stephen C. Hayes, Kelly Wilson, Robin Walzer, Kirk Strausel, and many others. Find your next training at praxiscet.com. That's praxiscet.com. One thing you say in your book that I thought was really interesting is that, that there's a difference between a body that is defined by what it does versus how it is. Can you talk about that and give a few examples maybe? Yes. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. So, so often who we are is what we do. It's the goals that we have for ourselves. And we set goals or we achieve certain things because we think that that then means that something about our identity. And so that could be, I need to get into a certain school I need a certain job. I need to drive a certain car. I need to have a, a partner who looks a certain way, right? And so a lot of our time is spent, A, orienting toward whatever the next goal is and or comparing ourselves to where we stack up among, alongside other, other, other people. And our orientation toward this is how we feel a sense of worth and belonging and dignity. And it's important to say that feeling a sense of worth, feeling that we belong and feeling that we deserve dignity are fundamental needs of everybody. So it's not wrong that we are needing that affirmation because all bodies need that. But what's happened in our society is that 
those affirmations come through aspects of capitalism. And we've gotten confused, right? And it's not our fault, right? This is how we've been shaped. This is, these are the pressures that have been put on us oftentimes since before we were born. Another one is like, I have to have a body that's a certain size and shape, right? And so all of our energy gets focused on doing, which is achieving, which is getting somewhere. But we've all heard those stories of people who had it all and were totally unhappy and dissatisfied and felt that their lives were empty because there's actually something much more important beyond just doing and achieving. And that is coming in touch with our our full humanity, what it means to be human, which means understanding ourselves not as individual, separate individuals, uh, but as part of an interconnected unit. And when we start to understand ourselves as uh, a collective body or recognizing our interconnection, then that shifts us out of the sense of competition and trying to achieve and trying to measure up and into more of a place of allowing ourselves to relate, to be, to notice, to take care. So that's the fundamental difference is a body between a body that is, you know, what it, what it is doing versus how it is. And so how does that actually look? Well, I think, you know, in the book, I have a list of a bunch of different things like a body that's a how versus a body that is, you know, uh, what it is. And I would say that, you know, I could name a couple of those. One of them is, ah, you know, a body that is able to rest in its how is there's more time for care. There's more time for rest. There's more time for prioritizing practice over doing. So it's not to say that we don't have goals, but rather than achieve trying to get to a certain marker, it's like, oh, I'm in a practice of this thing. And the practice itself is what is enriching me. Overall, there's just a sense of allowing for our full humanity and complexity, which means that we're sensing what is happening in our bodies and we're making time to take care of, notice, share, uh, metabolize what is arising on that level. I think that's really powerful what you said about it being a practice as well and that so many you know, so many of us, so many people think of everything as a destination to this certain thing where it's just always going to be a constant work, right? There, Like there's no end result. Yeah. There's no there there. Yeah, exactly. There's no there there. I mean, another thing that really comes into my work is like how important ritual is because ritual really shifts us into a place of allowing for our how because (laughs) we're connecting to uh, what is beyond ourselves. We're We're connecting to what is beyond the systems we live in. And I really think ritual is essential. Having some ritual in our life is essential for this very reason because how can one body that is living in the neoliberal society that we've created, how can it survive? How can it push back against all the pressure to do, do, do? Even if your value, even if that's not your values, those are the, those are the expectations that others put on you. And so it, it feels like an insurmountable task to say, okay, yeah, I'm not going to be oriented by what I do anymore. I'm going to be oriented by how I am. But then at the same time, I've got to put food on the table and I have deadlines and I have a job and there are expectations, right? And so it's like, whoa, how do I do that? What do I do? And so I really see ritual as this ancient technology that all of our bodies, like we all come from a line of bodies that engaged in ritual practice 
that is uh, in itself a technology that confronts the rapid pace of capitalism and neoliberalism. So whenever we're engaging in ritual, we are or we are letting ourselves be oriented by something that is much older and much wiser than these systems that we've created. They're they're new and you know they're <laughs> they're ineffective. And so I talk about in the book what I mean by ritual, but essentially ritual can be as simple as lighting a candle, you know, for a loved one or as elaborate as like a multi-day ceremony with drums and singing and dance. But it's allowing ourselves a moment to open up to what is beyond the scene world. And that could be depending on the cosmology that resonates with you, that could be the universe. It could be the interconnection of, you know, that, that are, that are present on the, on the, in the world, the physical world, right. All the mycelium networks listening for that. It could be spirit. It could be God. It could be, but it's something larger than yourself. And you're taking a moment to just listen, tune your radio dial to that channel. And it is amazing what comes through. It's like, it's just waiting for us. It's like, I am waiting. I'm so hungry and I'm so ready to support and guide you. And when you have that kind of practice with regularity in your life, over time, it gets into you and it starts to reshape how you are, what you're prioritizing and the pace that you're actually moving at. It's not something that happens overnight, which is again, the pressure uh, of the, the, the pressures of the systems we live in. It's like, oh, if I say I'm gonna do something then I, I need to be perfect at it by tomorrow. It's like, ah, over and over I show up, over and over I show up, over and over. like the rain that, the, that reshapes the, the terrain of earth right? And it's like that water seems so soft. It doesn't seem like it's going to have any effect. But over time, it completely reshapes what seems intractable, boulders and mountains, to, to that which supports its flow, to that which supports its ability to move how it wants to move. And I believe that ritual is like that. I love that. And I loved reading the section about ritual in your book. And it feels like ritual is almost just like the biggest act of surrender. Yeah. It's like a, it's like a, a, an opening toward, it's an opening toward something and then just seeing what arises. And I go into, you know, all the different complexities around ritual in there, um, uh, you know, from how do you do it <laughs> to what, like, how do I do this and not appropriate someone else's culture? So there's a lot of things to consider, but it it is, an, I, I believe, a really important embodiment practice. Yeah. And along with ritual, another thing you talk about a lot in the book is the body's need for slowness. Can you say a little bit more about why it's so important? Oh, uh, yeah. Our minds move really fast right? Like we can dart from one idea to the next. We can um, hold multiple ideas at the same time. And so the world we've, we've created actually uh, requires or like prefers that we move at that pace. But the truth is, is that while our minds can go 50 years into the future and 50 years into the past in the blink of an eye, um, our physical bodies they can't, they, they don't move at that pace. Our, our physical body does not move at the pace that our mind moves at. And so oftentimes there's a frustration that bodies can feel around that. It can feel like my body is holding me back or as our bodies age, it's like my mind has a capability, but my body isn't a, a, able to, to show up for me in the way that I want it to show up for me. And one of the beautiful teachings about being in a body because we all are in bodies is that 
they connect us with a different rhythm. And, and it's not to prioritize fast versus slow, but because we have over organized ourselves around pace and efficiency and productivity, then what we need is a rebalancing toward that which is more generative and emergent and nonlinear and in sync with the earth's rhythms, right? The cycles of the moon and the tides and the seasons. And our bodies inherently put us in contact with that. And in order for us to harness or be in relationship with how our bodies are able to relate to those more natural rhythms, it requires that we are making space to move at and be in the listening of what is the pace of my body. And as we start to notice, ah, okay, my body actually doesn't want to run. Oh, my body actually doesn't want to do this report right now. My body actually, oh, my body actually needs a walk. As we start to notice what our bodies need, inevitably, our minds are like freaking out. They're like, what? <laughs> but we got to, and what about, and hey, did you think, and oh, we got that, da, 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 right? The mind's like, blah, blah, blah. and that's totally natural. That's totally natural. And uh, what I believe is that our mind and body were actually designed to work together. But because our minds have been so dominant, because that has been the expectation culturally, that when we start to orient more toward the body, the mind is a little bit scared because it's used to having all of the control. And so we notice that the mind is darting from here to there to there. We notice that the mind is challenging what we're doing or judging or criticizing what we're doing, but we don't let the mind deter us from what we're sensing in the body. And then over time, when the mind starts to realize, ah, she's not going to listen to me. So I better, I better actually try to get on board here then that, that relationship starts to feel more uh, harmonious. But again, it takes practice. It takes practice. It takes showing up and doing that walk around the block at lunch every day. And then maybe by month two, your mind's like, oh, I think it's time for our walk. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> the first couple of times it's like, we don't have time for a walk. We, no, we've got, uh, maybe, maybe you can, you, you'll deserve a walk. That's the other thing is that mm. the mind treats caring for our body as like a treat, like a dessert, like we have to earn it. So if you don't earn it, then you don't get it. And so oftentimes we relegate these practices to the end of the day. But if we don't, if we don't accomplish everything on our list, then it's like, well, you don't get the cookie. And uh, I'm saying, hey, maybe there's another way. That's so relatable. The list, not getting to it, not getting the rewards. But I like that. It's like stop letting your mind steamroll your entire being. Yes. Yes, exactly. And Kelsey, as we start to wrap up, I want to ask about what role does community play in decolonizing the body? Uh, I, I end the book on community and I, I feel like it could be a whole other book about community. Our bodies, one thing that we start to listen for as we're tuning in that radio dial, and I sort of alluded to this, is that we're listening not only for what's happening in our own body, but we're also hearing what's happening in other bodies around us. And so I will often refer to, we have our own body and then we have a sense of the group body or the collective body. And our bodies are designed to be in relationship to others with the sense of a unit. So I, like you could think about like a flock of birds, right? Like there's the individual birds, but then they're moving together. And so there's a way in which 
I believe the human animal is designed to live within a collective that is orienting toward life in a way that supports like supporting the individual and also being in relationship with the larger world in a way that is sustainable. I think that there is a epidemic of loneliness in our world, an epidemic of isolation, which is an impact of uh, neoliberalist economics, which is that everything is a competition and everyone is measuring up against everyone else. And so when you live in a society that is oriented toward the sense of an individual, then inevitably there aren't systems of support because it, it's, it's a weakness to show need. It's a weakness to ask for help. It's a, a cost on your own time to show up for someone else, right? There's no guarantee that if you show up for someone else that they're going to be able to take care of your needs, right? And so I think that there is a lot of work that needs to be done, both on a systemic level, a political level, um, a financial level, to create systems that actually do support us to, to come together and move as a collective. There's a lot of healing that's needed here. And at the same time, I was holding this question of, okay, well, what can my body do to recognize and take care of the fact that I am designed to move within a collective, even though that might not be readily available to me? And practice that I've been in, that I offer in this book, is a way in which we can orient toward the collective that is around, even if it isn't the kind of community that we envision when we think of community. Because the truth is that we are fundamentally interconnected. And all of our, our ability to be alive in this moment is, is not because of our individual ingenuity and individual skills and, and strategy. While that might, might come into it, it's because we are inherently supported by other bodies. Some of those bodies we might see and recognize and some we, we might not. And so if I understand that my survival is due to the fact that I am woven into a collective, then can I start to attune my awareness to seeing those relationships? And as I'm attuning my awareness to those, seeing those relationships, can I show up with that understanding and appreciation, which is to say, ah, uh, as I see who are part of my community, can I acknowledge that and say, okay, this is this, you are one of the beings that I am leaning on. And now let, let's actually make this um, official. <laughs> um, let me let me say, hey, like I'm here for you. And by the way, like I hope that you know how much I appreciate the way that you're here for me. And can we build on this relationship with intention? And some of these relationships, because I wrote this book during the pandemic, <laughs> so it was very isolated. But some of these relationships, I realized, are relationships in our more than human world for me. So I started to look to the natural environment and... Uh, we have frogs in our backyard. And I started to see, ah, oh, the frogs. Uh, it's so comforting when I go to sleep and they're out there croaking, you know, like they're settling my nervous system. I, uh, they're regulating me. And so how can I show up for them? How can I be in relationship with them to recognize that they're a part of my community? And ah, these trees that I, I like to go to they're a part of my community. And then, you know, also looking at what are those relationships of the people that I stayed in touch with during the pandemic? And are there ways in which I can prioritize those relationships, not as like, oh, these sort of like, this is just part of my personal life, but actually like, this is part of, like, this is an essential component of 
what it means to be alive for me. And so I'm going to put my time and energy toward maintaining and sustaining those relationships. And when we do that, we uh, find that we are moving at a slower pace and we are immediately taken out of that, like the hustle and grind of getting ahead and more into honoring and connection and, you know, sharing our vulnerability, which I believe is part of our design. Oh, that's really powerful. And I I like that you mentioned the frogs because (laughs) there's this random outside bunny that looks like an, it should be someone's pet, but it just lives on this street in my neighborhood. And it truly was like my reason for going for a walk just to like pass by this bunny. And then slowly over time, I started bringing it carrots and it started to trust me and come up to me. And now it's still like a big highlight of my day. And it's just this like sweet bunny that's just outside. I love that so much. That's amazing that there's a, a, a wild bunny. Yeah. And he just lives on this street. Everyone brings him carrots. I I love it. (laughs) Oh, that's so good. The thing that that your share kind of like reminds me of is that when we start to see those those beings or those other parts of our community, it makes our lives richer. We don't feel as alone. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, you know, like I am part of something. It's important. Yeah, it's a really nice, a nice reminder as well. Kelsey, do you have any final thoughts for our listeners? So I guess one thing I'll say is that I wrote this book for women of color because that's the lens that I navigate from, right? Like that's how I'm racialized in the world. And at the same time, all of our bodies are are shaped by these different systems, the patriarchy, racialized capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't believe that any body is actually winning in these systems. Even the bodies that we think are winning, I don't believe they are. I I don't believe anyone is. And so while the book is for women of color, I invite bodies who uh, might be outside of that identity to read it because I think there are overlaps. I think there are overlaps from our experience that other bodies women bodies, white bodies, queer bodies, male bodies would feel some resonance or see some uh, ex- experience some resonance around. And there are a lot of practices in there because I wanted the book to not just be, I mean, it's about the body and yet it's a book. So it's, <laughs> I was like, how do we do a book about the body? <laughs> and so there's a lot of practice. I wanted it to feel three-dimensional in the sense that you're not just reading it, but you're able to experience it and receive practices that can really help folks start to unhook or tease out the way those systems have conditioned their own bodies and start to free themselves from those, those embodiments. Yeah, I totally agree. And I appreciate that you said anybody could get something from it. I I know I got a lot from it and from this conversation. So thank you so much for your time and for your work. And I really appreciate you talking with me. Thank you so much, Cassie. It was a pleasure. Written by a woman of color for women of color, Decolonizing the Body offers proven effective somatic, body-centered practices to help you heal from systemic oppression, trust the profound wisdom of your own body, and reconnect with your true self. And by slowing down, cultivating a daily ritual, and setting strong boundaries, you can reclaim your inherent dignity and worth, as well as those aspects of yourself that you may have cast aside in an effort to survive. With this empowering guide, you'll discover how bodies are colonized through systems of oppression, why slowing down is essential for healing, how to listen to what your body needs, how to create a space for ritual in your daily life, how to strengthen feelings of capability, and how to cultivate community starting with yourself. To decolonize the body is to become whole again and to come home again. Let this book be your guide on this crucial journey. Visit our website at www.newharbinger.com and use coupon code PODCAST25 to receive 25% off your entire order. New Harbinger Publications is an independent, employee-owned publisher of books on psychology, health, spirituality, and personal growth. For 50 years, our evidence-based self-help books and pioneering workbooks have helped readers make positive changes to improve mental health and well-being. 
Founded by psychologist Matthew McKay and Patrick Fanning, New Harbinger is proud to be an employee-owned company. Our books reflect our core values of integrity, sustainability, compassion, and trust. Written by leaders in the field and recommended by therapists worldwide, New Harbinger books are practical, accessible, and provide real tools for real change. Help your clients achieve lasting emotional balance with the DBT Skills Mega Bundle from New Harbinger Publications. This essential collection offers everything you need to effectively deliver dialectical behavior therapy in your practice, including a set of eight exclusive microskills videos to help improve client motivation in treatment. Visit newharbinger.com for more information. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd love if you rated, reviewed, and subscribed to the show, and we hope you might share it with anyone who might benefit from the content. This podcast is not a substitute for counseling with a licensed provider.